Thank you. Wow, it's really great to be here. I had a lot of fun. Uh, first of all, it's a fantastic conference. And I've never been to, I've been to very few conferences that had so many women over all the years I've been here. And I, the mark, the hallmark of how many women are at this conference was when it was time to take the break. They have four restrooms on the first floor. Three of them were women and you still had to wait. <laughs> but you should give yourselves a hand for being here. It's fantastic to see you. We also want to thank the organizers for this conference. It was pretty amazing. As each speaker came up, they made your mind think about, oh, this is a new technique. That's a new idea. It really forced you to think about ways that you could expand the work that you're doing. And, I, and to accomplish that is, is quite difficult, given the space of activities that you guys represent. So let's also thank the organizers. So up here somewhere, they tell me there's a clicker but I fail to know where it is. And it's not there, unless this is it. Ah, oh, see, it looks like that. Sorry about that. <laughs> so this is what a camera looked like at the time American jurisprudence was trying to figure out what were gonna be the rules for photographing people in public. And they decided that if you wanted to photograph people in public, you, needed their, uh, you did not need their permission. That is, we could take a photograph of everyone here, and we don't need permission. This is what a telephone looked like at the time American jurisprudence was trying to figure out what were going to be the rules for recording someone's phone conversation. And they decided that you did need uh, permission to actually record people's conversation. So for your photo, no permission. For your conversation, we need permission. Does anybody know what this is? You laugh. Every year as I, ask the, as I ask students, the number of students who know what this is gets fewer. <laughs> this is the Sony camcorder. And in the 1980s, it was the first mass market uh, product that combined both the recording of video and sound. And it had no mute button. That meant when it hit the American market, it was automatically going to put people at odds with the rules that we had decided we live by. And sure enough, in no time at all, there was the story of a mother who sort of equipped one of those camcorders to her child and recorded abuses from a bus driver on a bus. She goes down to the police station, she, she records these atrocities happening to her child, and they arrest her for illegal wiretapping. There was a story of a uh, protest uh, happening in Boston, and one of the bystanders pulls out one of the camcorders and begins recording the police arresting one of the protesters. The police stops arresting the protester, turns around and arrests the young man who had the camcorder and he faced seven years in prison for illegal wiretapping. Now we fast forward to today. Today, um, there are laws and uh, there, we, we blah, blah, blah. <laughs> let's try that again. Today, uh, most school buses in Pennsylvania under a state law actually have cameras on them. And today, it, uh, most of us know that we can, thanks to the ACLU, we can actually record uh, in the, uh, public servants in the process of their uh, service in public. So we've seen a lot of police arrest, at, police arrests, for example. That, that those examples show us how technology design, how powerful it is, how easy it, how um, a simple arbitrary decision, the lack of a mute button forced us to change the laws that we live by. This is a sleep number bed. It's an air mattress system. And the new, one of its new innovations is this thing called Sleep IQ, which is basically a bank of sensors that lay across the top of the bed. And it monitors how you sleep, how you move, your breathing rate, heart rate, and so forth. And the data leaves your home, goes through the internet to their server. And in the morning, you can get online and see how well you slept. So this is the Apple Watch. I've got one too. And it too is trying to tell me that I need to exercise more and how well I slept as well. But the difference in this design is the data stored locally on my cell phone. Those are two different design choices. 
And I use these examples to point out that we live in a technocracy. That is, that we live in a world in which technology design dictates the rules we live by. We don't know these people. We didn't vote for them in office. There was no debate about their design. But yet, the rules that they determine by the design decisions they make, and many of them somewhat arbitrary, end up dictating how we will live our lives. In my own life, I began this work as a computer scientist. I was a graduate student at MIT, compelled to build a thinking machine. It was a lifelong dream I'd always had. And I was doing quite well. I had, had sort of gotten my first major project done. It was a system that would learn the sounds of a system the way a child would, and sort of promised to ch totally revolutionize the way we do speech recognition. And one day, an ethicist came by, and I heard her say, computers are evil. Me, who was passionately in love with technology, I had to stop because I was clearly going to have to correct her thinking. But she foretold a situation in which really it's the world we have today. The, and the year back then was at the uh, mid-1990s. And she described a world in which information was flowing from individuals freely, and that the consequence of that was that many social contracts and many new harms were going to be possible. And so I told her, but yeah, but look at all the benefits of sharing all this data. You know, we may have new medical discoveries and so forth. And so she pointed to a particular data set that had just been released. It was medical information on state employees, their families, and retirees. And the Venn diagram you see in the upper left corner is an example of the kind of data that was given away. It didn't have name or address, but it did include diagnosis codes, procedure codes, and basic demographics, a five-digit zip code, month, day, and year of birth, and gender. And so I said to her, well, why do you think that's anonymous? And I, I said, look, there are 365 days in a year. Let's say people live 100 years and two genders. That's over 70,000 combinations per five-digit zip code. But I happen to know that at that time, there were only about 20,000 people living in a particular five-digit zip code. And so I wanted to test if this was right. So William Weld, who was the governor of Massachusetts at the time, had collapsed. And there wasn't much information about him in uh, the public media. But on the other hand, his information was in this data set. He lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and his demographics were well known. So for $20, I went and I purchased the Cambridge voter list, and it came on two floppy diskettes. <laughs> and I was able to show that only six people in that voter data had his date of birth, only three of them were men, and he was the only one in his five-digit zip code. That meant that that combination was unique for him, and therefore it was unique in the data. What was powerful about that very simple experiment is that one day I'm a graduate student at MIT, and the next day I'm testifying before Congress. Because it wasn't just that data set that was shared that way. That's how it was done around the world on all data sets. The idea of anonymous data was simply to take off the name and address and leave these other pieces of data. And then we did a model based on 1990 data that showed that most people in the United States are unique by date of birth, gender, and zip code. That of impact, the ability to have a simple experiment and, go, and have dramatic impact was huge and something that stayed with me forever. It's been really guided most, most of my career. Um, because, in fact, my work is that simple experiment is quoted in the preamble of HIPAA and quoted in the rewrite of privacy laws around the world. As notice, it was just a very simple experiment. What about today? So we've had, we've seen the new, the new thing for technology that's new is AI. And what was AI becomes new technology, and that everything from location tracking to predicting the price of a ride to self-driving cars to even something like um, fraud prevention or determining credit lines to face recognition and so forth. This is um, the Echo by Amazon, um, and you put it in your house. You can ask questions. It looks up answers somewhat on the internet, uh, in particular through particular search engines. But the consequences that I talked about in my early year as a graduate student still remain. So for example, if you ask Alexa who is an ape, Alexa will tell you John McCain. 
Now clearly, that's not desired. <laughs> so we live in a technocracy, and unforeseen consequences of this technolo technology continue to be with us today. Let me give you another example. When I came to Harvard, I was having a interview by a reporter, Adam Tanner, who's a well-known reporter, and I wanted to show him a paper that I had done. And so um, I went to Google, and I Googled my name, and yes, Google is a verb. Um, and so I, I type in my name in the Google search bar, and I'll pop this ad saying that I had, implying that I had an arrest record. And so I tell Adam, there's the paper that we're looking for. And he says, forget that paper. Tell me about when you were arrested. <laughs> and I tell Adam, well, I wasn't arrested, right? And he says, then why does Google say you were? And I, you know, I told him, well, Google's not saying I am. It's an ad. He says, well, they can't just be saying you're arrested if, if they don't have an arrest record on you. We go back and forth and back and forth. And so eventually I spend, the, spend money to show him that, in fact, no one named Latanya Sweeney, for which I think I'm the only one in the world, um, but no one with that name has an arrest record even by that company. And so we started searching around some more. And we found these other kinds of arrest ads coming up for people whose first name were LaTanya. So Adam, a white Italian American, jumps to the conclusion. He says, that's because you have one of those black sounding first names. And I said, what are you talking about black sounding first names? <laughs> so now I put my experimental hat on and I'm going to show him again how he's wrong. So I go to Google Images and I type in LaTanya. <laughs> <laughs> and then I type in Tanya. And then I realized there really are these first names given more often to black babies than to white babies. And the, so eventually I end up doing studies that basically using a VPN network, we collected 140,000 ad deliveries when searched the names of, of, of actual Americans. And we were able to show that even in places where other people had no arrest record under that name, the company had one, they still implied arrest records. And places where you would see neutral ads that didn't imply arrest records, they would have records of someone. That's not necessarily the Kristen Lynch. I just want to point that out. I don't know if she's here, but I'm just saying. Uh, but someone with her name actually did have one, even though the ad itself is neutral. What we found from that 140,000 ads was we found that that if you had a name given more often to black babies than white babies, that you were 80% more likely to get an arrest ad than the other way around. And this turns out to be a violation of the Civil Rights Act. So discrimination in the United States is not illegal. So as you can see, my gray hair, I'm looking forward to senior citizen discounts. I see some of you are quite young. I know you're already taking advantage of student discounts. Discrimination is not illegal. But what is illegal are certain people in certain situations. So one of those protected groups are blacks, and one of those situations is employment. So what happens when you apply for a job? Somebody goes online to see what they can find out about you. That is, they might, in fact, Google your name. And if the ads are popping up implying that you have an arrest record, then, in fact, you're at a disadvantage. It's not about the intent or whether it was intended. It's just the fact alone is enough. And the 80-20 split happens to be the same split that the Department of Justice uses to open up a civil rights case. So again, a simple experiment ends up being the first example of how do we think about our existing laws uh, in a technological framework. And so since then, of course, there's been lots of work on racial discrimination, algorithmic bias, and so forth based on this study. One of the things that's interesting was the company maintained that it had put down ads on every, the name of all adult Americans, and that they had put down the recommended the same uh, search strings, the same responses or the same ads for everyone else. And that they claimed that what was really happening was the more society would click on it, the more the Google algorithm would reward that one. And, and so that in some sense, this was a bias of society where the more often the, the, that the arrest ads were clicked more often for black names and the neutral ads were clicked more often than white names. Um, however, later on, I become the chief technology officer at the FTC. I learned they got fined, so I don't know about that, um, that that was really true, but it was an interesting theory. 
But back to our talk. So we live in a technocracy, and look, clearly the Civil Rights Act is up for grabs. This is another study while I was at the FTC. The, this is the Pittsburgh Courier. It was one of the most popular and widely circulated black newspaper in its heyday. And its peak, it had a, a population of about 200,000. If you wanted to place an ad in the Pittsburgh Courier, there were, they had a, a group of people who had to review that ad to see if it was appropriate for their audience. So this is an example of an ad from Neiman's. This is what the Pittsburgh Courier looks like today. It's a website. And the ads are delivered automatically by um, an ad network. It's not, it's not reviewed by anyone who works there. So whether or not it's appropriate is not easy for them to necessarily to determine. So we were interested in what is that kind of ad experience uh, for different groups when I was at the FTC. So we looked at this particular website. This is Omega Sci-Fi, which is a popular black fraternity. And they were having their 100th year anniversary. And we were interested in what kind of ads got delivered. Well, there were ads for getting a graduate degree. There were ads for um, travel, all of which you would expect. Um, but, and then there, these arrest ads, back again. Uh, <laughs> They may not be on Google search, but they are still around. Uh, but we also saw credit card ads. And one of the questions we had was, what is the credit card ad experience on these kinds of websites? And if you were to go and look at surveys of, 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 of credit cards, you would get a rating of those that are highly praised and those that are considered kind of the, or certainly highly, harshly criticized, one could argue kind of the worst credit cards. And what we saw were only ads for the worst possible credit cards showed up on the Omega Sci-Fi website. Why? So we looked at the most popular, most praised card, which is American Express Blue. Shout out for all of you who've got that credit. Good for you. Um, at that particular time, as you can see on the right, they were doing an ad campaigns particularly focused with, with, at education. So that even begged the question even more. Why is Omega Sci-Fi not getting these ads. And we saw these other kinds of things. I use this as an example to say the Credit Reporting Act up for grabs. What is the fairness? We, you know, it's actually illegal in a, in, uh, to disadvantage a group by only providing them financial instruments of one kind, for example. Let's take a couple more examples. You visit a doctor, you say, who gets your data? Well, if we were to ask this question back in 1998, you'd probably kind of think around and say, well, the pharmacy, the insurance company, maybe my employer knows something about my health data. So we did some homework and we surveyed and we were able to, to document thousands of data sharing arrangements of, your, of a typical person, Alice, who's, who's her, where all the places her medical record would go. If you visit the website, you can click on one of the circles and it will tell you uh, the documentation we have for each of those sources. One of the things that's interesting, other than the sheer volume of places that your health record could go, is that only about half of those records are actually uh, covered by HIPAA. The other half, there are no rules that govern them at all. And what you see in the middle is this thing called discharge data. How many of you know what hospital discharge data is? Uh, a couple people. How many, well, let's see. Let's see if you're in it. Um, how many people have ever gone to a hospital or to a physician's office in the United States? Okay, so the, a copy of that information is in hospital discharge data. These are statewide collections, uh, and the dash line means that when they share it or give it away, it's de-identified. That is, it doesn't have your name or address on it. Uh, so we wanted to know how, how good is that? So, 33 of the states actually sell or share, all 50 states collected. 33 states sell it or give it away. But at that time, only three states did so in a way that was as strong as HIPAA. So now, this is an interesting question. Are the other 30 states, do they know something? Is HIPAA too stringent? Is it messing up data more than it should? And therefore, we should lower the federal standard? Or is it that these 30 states are putting the data more at risk? 
So to answer this, for 50 bucks, we went and we bought this data from the state of Washington. It included millions of hospital visits, and they reported 99.99% compliance. And this is, a, it had about 300 fields. This is an example of some of the fields. It includes diagnosis codes, procedure codes, a breakdown of charges, and some demographics. And what we wanted to know was, could someone who knew something about you be able to find you in the data? It might be your credit card company, it might be your employer, it might be just your neighbors being nosy, or family or friends. Could they actually figure out which of these millions of records are yours? So Harvard had a, a, a database of old newspaper archives that included places in Washington. And it had about 82 articles of these kinds of blotter stories reporting people who had to go to a hospital for whatever, whatever reason, whether it was a traffic accident or a shooting or what have you. And we were interested in saying how unique is that blotter story to which of these millions of records does it match exactly? Match one and only one record. So we began popping them in. And without using any statistics, this is just a one-to-one -one match that only one and only one record showed up in 43% of the samples. So Washington State did respond, as you can imagine getting that phone call from me. Um, <laughs> but they did respond in a good way, and that is they changed their laws. So within a year of the study, they changed the law so that you can still, for $50, get the hospital discharge data from the state of Florida, I mean, the state of Washington. But in fact, when you do so, um, it, it, you can't do this experiment. Again, it's, it, won't, it won't work. If you need the more detailed data, they have a more rigorous application process that you have to go through to get it. The bad news, though, is after the experiment, it really only changed of the 30 states that had these kind of practices. Only Washington State and California changed their rules. The other states, unlike what had happened with HIPAA, where one experiment toppled around the world, we see a lot more rigidity. And some of that rigidity is because there's a lot of money in data and so forth, and, it, and so it's a lot harder to demonstrate these, to, for one demonstration of a problem to replicate. So Jisoo, who's here, Jisoo Yu somewhere, uh, who works with me, so she began tackling them state by state. So she just did Maine and Vermont. So we're going to see uh, how many of the 30 she ha has to do before they all sort of adopt better practices. So we do thank her for that because it raises the privacy bar for all of us. Where are you, Jisoo? All right, maybe she stepped out. Anyway, oh, oh she's over there. <laughs> okay. So health privacy, though, is also up, up for grabs. This is an example from Alvaro Badeo. He's at uh, Georgetown. And he points out the idea of what happens if you have a, um, a, a program that's actually going to recommend people for employment. So the first time around, it sort of gives you all of these potential applicants. And the employer selects some and rejects others. It's a learning algorithm, so over time, it's only going to bring you young people, because that was your bias in your selection. And I use that example to say yet another of our rules, equal employment, is up for grabs. And we recently published a paper when we followed the 2016 election that pointed out that 36 websites, uh, state websites, allowed uh, hacking through identity theft to impact voters' ability to cast votes uh, on their, from their website. And so even elections are up for grabs. In fact, I would use those examples to say every value, every democratic value is up for grabs by what technology allows or doesn't allow. And what's scary about it is there's no, it's sort of like we're in a car, we're going for this ride, but nobody's driving. It's like people are taking turns randomly. So what do we do about it? So when I was at the FTC, fraud is one of the things the FTC looks at. And we did yet another experiment. We came up with this idea of, ex uh, of a calculation called an exclusivity index of a domain. And it basically says what percentage of people visit a domain uh, more than any other percentage of like groups. The reason that, that uh, exclusivity is useful 
is because when you look at households who are visiting different domains on the, web, on the, on the internet, the first 10 are all kind of the same, Twitter, Facebook, Google. But as you get down, people go to particular places, particular kinds of communities for uh, more intimate conversation, more trust. And fraud at the FTC is about the kind of trust where you open up your savings account and are willing to give the person all your money. It's not really the spam stuff. It's that when you're having a conversation among like-minded people, you're more and more likely to have trust. And so the question is, could we find these pockets? And so we created this index, uh, and the closer the value is to one, like in this example, the percentage of Latino visitors, uh, the, the more unique it is to you. So this is an example that households with children, um, people who have children go to websites that people who don't have children never see, and that kind of makes sense. And we can do this also by race. The red line is two standard deviations above, and, uh, and we see also uh, particular domains that also make sense by race. But more importantly, we were able to use those domains to track fraud. That is, to actually go to find a website that's more likely to have fraud and be able to find evidence of it there. I sort of walk through that quickly because I want to get to the end and I'm running out of time. Um, but I want to use that example to say how it is we're able to do experiments, sort of harness technology in a way, for, for the good of the public interest. That is, we already have rules and we already have helpers. The question is, how do we help the helpers? How do we help the advocates, the regulators, the journalists do a better job? And as I look back over the examples that I just gave you, you can see that that, that really has been the hallmark of the work that I described from myself. That is somewhat simple experiments. I like to think I'm really smart, but the truth is these are really simple experiments. But they had a profound impact because they empowered someone else to be able to do their job better or to be able to take that message. So when I came back to Harvard after being at the FTC, I decided I didn't want it to stop there. That is, these experiments are attainable by undergraduate students. So I taught a class called Data Science to Save the World. And I told the students, at the end of this class, you're going to do a project. And if your project's any good, I'll take you down to DC and give you an audience of regulators. And so I put aside about money to take down two or three students. And I took down 26 students. It was pretty amazing. And we, so we set it up in a poster session style. And it was totally electric. It was supposed to go for two hours. It went for four hours. The students, the typical regulator is a white guy, a middle-aged white guy. And who, do, who's, who has the responsibility of regulating the technology, but who really doesn't understand the technology or know about it. Meanwhile, you have these young students who are early adopters of technology, who are right on the front line, who know the technology intimately. And so the idea and the exchange was very, very powerful. The students really did feel as though they had impact and the regulators learned critical information. We decided when we left there, we weren't going to let it stop there. We should find a way to memorialize this, to keep repeating this process. So we had the idea of starting a new journal called the Journal of Technology Science. It was actually called the Harvard Journal of Technology Science. And then Harvard says, oh, you can't use our name unless you go get a board of people who say the papers are good enough to use Harvard's name. It doesn't matter that you're a Harvard professor. You have to go get another group of people. When I did go to get this other group of people, I asked 50 researchers from around the world who sort of work in this area. All uh, 48 of them said yes, and two said I would do it, but I'm doing something else. I'm a dean or whatever. And with that kind of response, we realized it was a much bigger thing than a Harvard thing. So we dropped the whole Harvard name. <laughs> and so the, so the Journal of Technology Science has been publishing these kinds of papers from researchers and students and scholars from around the world, these kinds of things that have unforeseen consequences. But the first papers, and I'll just finish in just a second, the first papers are those that came from those 26 students. You can see all of the papers online. But this is, I just want to give you a sample of a few. This is Daniel Rothschild. Fraud at the FTC is really was a chase them down kind of thing. Enough people would complain that they had been defrauded and then an investigator would come to see what was wrong, but by then the fraudster's long gone. And so Daniel just simply built a really simple system 
that would identify through tweets where fraud is actually happening, what website is it currently live on. Um, and that actually has transformed the way the FTC does its fraud. They use this software and they've built on it since. The students had recently, another group of students had recently um, taken the SAT and they'd used Princeton Review um, as a service, an online service to tutor them in the SAT. And they remembered that, the, that Princeton Review would only give them a price once you gave them a zip code. So they mined out the prices for all 33,000 zip codes in the United States. And they were able to show at scale sort of this People in New England pay a lot more than people in San Francisco for the same service. But if you go into this, but it's not everyone in New England paying the higher price. It's primarily communities that uh, have an Asian population. Or said the other way, an Asian family is more, almost twice as likely to pay the higher price. They ended up on the Today Show and so forth. And similarly, we showed price discrimination, or a group of students showed price discrimination on Airbnb. Airbnb responded. Uh, if there's anybody here from Airbnb, you get thumbs up. They responded, because look, a lot of this is basically shaming them into something. And Airbnb responded in a great way. They now do price recommendations, for example. This will be the last one I'll show you. This is Facebook. Um, so Facebook had a feature that most of the in industry media called a bug, that in Facebook Messenger would report your location as you're, as you're sending out messages. And so Iran built a little plug-in that you could load in your browser, and then you could track people as they're sending out Facebook messages. And within nine days, Facebook fixed this uh, bug, I mean feature, um, and, 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 and corrected it, something they hadn't been able to do for many years. And, um, and so, but what made Iran's story, I think, even more powerful was the simple fact that he had been given a summer fellowship. He arrives here in Silicon Valley, uh, and the day before he's to show up at Facebook, they canceled his summer fellowship. So, now don't feel bad about it. Within the week, he, had, he got, somebody else hired him with almost twice the pay. He ended up with a TED Talk a Time Magazine article, he, he, you know, now he works for Amazon, he's in good shape. But it does, those examples do point us to the impact that simple, well done experiments can have. And, but this talk isn't actually about me, and it's not even about my students, it's about you. All of you are empowered with the ability to do those experiments and to save the world. Thank you. So we have time for just really one great question. And I know there will be many. So who wants to ask the question before lunch? But we will not leave until the question That's right. Is asked. We're staying here. <laughs> so, yeah. so if you yeah. want to do us all a favor and get to lunch. There is a question we there. Have the some, we have a few hands up. Uh, yeah. Here we go. <laughs> Uh, I actually work on the Alexa product, so thanks for the <laughs> shout out. <laughs> um, so GDPR just came out, and a lot of companies are scrambling to be compliant with new European regulations. And from my side of the story, it feels like there wasn't a study done to understand the technology before the policy was released. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on how do we make sure that policy and technology go at the same pace? Well, policy and technology will never go at the same pace. You know, uh, policy is sort of a function of months or years, and technology is a function of days. So there, there's automatic temporal mismatch. And what the EU is trying to do is they're trying to come up with draconian po policies, draconian in the sense that they're massive and so that there's no wiggle room. Just to give you an example, just so, to level set everyone, if the idea of privacy laws is to cover a naked body, the 2,167 privacy laws we have in the United States are like little dots that clump up on 50 spots on, the, on that body, leaving almost the entire body exposed. The EU approach is to drape the entire body with a law, with a, sort of like with a cloth to give it protection. 
This difference is really important because it means that in, because in the United States there are no rules, there are no laws to prohibit anything, then it means anything goes until it doesn't. But right until you hit the border of the EU, at which time their laws will apply. And they're making a bet that if you want the EU market, instead of having two versions of something, you're gonna change the version and therefore raise the bar for everyone. Or said a different way, I often say the difference of these legal paradigms is sort of why Mark Zuckerberg could introduce Facebook in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but not Cambridge, England. He's a student and he decided that people, he was gonna create a platform where individuals, students could share this kind of information. But in Cambridge, England, that kind of information was covered even then, and he would have had to go get permission. And maybe he would have just not taken the time, he would have just done something else with it instead. So it, this relationship of our lack of privacy laws, our lack of coverage of privacy laws, has given our technology companies an advantage of a kind. But our technology companies now run a series of disruptions unless they get better at predicting or controlling that. Well, thanks very Thank much, you. Latanya. This is terrific. Uh, I'm so glad you're here. Thank you.